Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 549th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Greg Peterson coming to you from a toasty, warm urban farm in the heart of Phoenix, Arizona. And Janice is here tonight. She's in the background. And I am here with Bill McDormand. Welcome, Bill. Hello, Greg. How are you this evening? Fantastic. Bill and I go back, oh, at least a decade. And I have to, I was thinking about it earlier today, Bill. You are my most on the show guest for the podcast. And I absolutely love that. So thank you for that. Wow. I'm Uh, honored. Wow. Well, you know, we've been doing these seed chats for what, three years? Wow. Well, we always thought we'd get into trouble. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Somehow. Yeah, let's uh, let's continue that on. So welcome, Bill. Thanks for being here tonight. And what are we talking about tonight? Hopefully just answer questions. I mean, I've got I can bring up some stuff, but about um, the more difficult to save seeds. Yes. You know, that one of the things we learned early on in our seed teaching careers was that, you know, that it's there's uh, several things that are really easy. For, mm-hmm. for gardeners. And every gardener should probably do them. I mean, you can do it mindlessly. But there are some things that are more difficult. And so as you get more experience and you get into it, more questions arise. And of course, everybody wants to up their game. And so we can talk along those lines this evening. Cool. So, and then also, I'm going to post in the chat box a copy of your book, a PDF copy of your book. Tell us a little bit about the book. And it's only for people that were here live tonight. So tell us yeah, a little bit about we- your book. Well, you know, we, I wrote it in, I think it was 1994. Wow. When I owned my small seed company and it was really a frustrated, I was frustrated. You know, it, I uncovered through my own, you know, sort of trial and error and other things that not only was seed saving important globally. And if anybody's been to our seed schools or knows me, that's sort of been my gospel for my whole right. career, but it can also be really easy. And as I said before, you know, most seed saving books up to that point, and we can talk about some of them tonight, they're really, really good. And they have lots of technical and incredible information. Mm -hmm. However, for a beginner, they're overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they start with Latin in their table of contents, Latin names and things. And for people that just want to save carrot seeds in their backyard or something, you know, it just seemed like too much. Also, they were very expensive. You know, for me, I lived in rural Idaho. A $30 book was a big investment. Oh, yeah. And so that, that spurred me on to write a book that cost five bucks or five ninety five, something really cheap, that organized itself so that the really, really easy seeds to save were up front. So if you just wanted to get started and get your wings and you could do that, you could open up the book and in two or three for five bucks and in two or three minutes, feel like you had enough information to last you a lifetime to save, you know, tomatoes and peppers and peas and beans and lettuce. Those are the easiest ones to save. And so that that's how the book came about. Beautiful. Well, I just posted, and this is for people that are live on the uh, com- the event tonight. I posted a Google Drive link so that you can download the book. Just let's touch on, because we talked about this in past, let's touch on what are the simple ones. I don't want you to tell us how to save them, but let's start with what are the simple seeds to save? Give me well, like a just, minute on that. Well, let's just start with the category they're in. So if people find other things that are in other parts of the world, they can, you know, maybe there's other things they could fit into the category. So for me, the easiest things to save seeds from are the things that not only produce their seeds in one season, in other words, you plant them and you can have your seeds by the end of the growing season. But they're also what we call self-pollinating. Selfers is what we lovingly mm-hmm. call them. Mm-hmm. And so what that means is that their flowers are structured so that they largely pollinate themselves before the flowers even open or before something else can get in there and bring pollen from another flower. Now, of course, this isn't a perfect system, and you never say never in, in seed saving. Something can always um, cross things up or cause problems, but by and large, that's the case. And so what it means is that you can plant something, grow the plant, save seeds from it, and you're good to go. You can pretty much depend on those seeds re- reproducing themselves the next year into plants that looked a lot like the parents that you had before. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to worry about you know uh, unforeseen monsters. <laughs> we lovingly call things like pump zinis 
you know, crosses <laughs> pumpkins and zucchinis or something like that. You're not going to cause those kinds of problems with the sulfurs. And so, you know, that for most American gardeners, those are, and I'll say them again, tomatoes, peppers, peas, beans, and lettuce. And so those are some of the most popular vegetables in America anyway. I mean, right. my art, the goal of our programs is to get a million new seed savers and, and get them doing those. I mean, it wouldn't, you know, it'd be easy. All we have to do really is tell them they can. <laughs> right. We've, all, we, we've sort of collectively forgotten that in this country. Mm -hmm. And we go through all the myths that people have. Oh, I've got to buy my seeds because they're better when they're from somewhere else. Well, that's not definitely not true. Oh, right. you need a big university or a corporate breeding program to come up with better things. Oh, no, you don't. You know, mm -hmm. and we go through that systematically and prove that we, by and large, as American gardeners, been hoodwinked into thinking that our own seeds aren't the best. And when really we make the argument that they are. And so learning how to do this is not only um, good for you, could be good for your pocketbook, but it's probably good for the planet in an overall manner and that we're helping to bring diversity back into our agricultural system. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. Rebecca Newburn is on. Oh, wow. She's on with us tonight. She said wheat is super easy, too. It's beautiful in the garden as well. Thank you for saying that. And I we're, we're coming around to that. You know, wheat and barley are both that way. And so we've got a fantastic grain trials program going at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance now. And it's so much fun. I've got um, 10 different varieties of wheat growing in my garden at the same time. Oh, nice. And I'm, and I'm really not afraid that they're going to cross. You know, I have a little bit of space in between them and mm -hmm. maybe they will cross and I'll come up with something new. I mean, that's the level of adventure I'm on these days. But thank you, Rebecca. You're right. And I'm honored that you're on the program. And then you come up with a bar wheat or a wheat bar or something, right? Yeah. Well, I don't believe the wheat and the barley are going to cross, but the different uh, kinds. I've got Armenia black wheat. I've got black and tan, tan naked einkorn growing. Oh. I have Pirani, which comes from, this is the 2,000-year-old uh, the wheat that was found. Some of it was found reputedly in Herod's tomb, you know, oh, from the wow. very birth of Christianity. And so, you know, those are the things that I'm growing. And, and, so, you know, if they, if they cross, you know, my, my ultimate goal is something that grows here in Cornville, Arizona, that tastes good. And so bring it on, mix and match. So most of what we save seeds from, and we'll talk about the harder ones to save, but most of what we save seeds from are vegetables. Why is grains so important in this whole mix? Well, you know, as I love to quote Evan Sofro, who was a farm manager for us when my wife, Bella, and I were the co-directors at Native Seed Search. Evan goes, you know, Bill, you know, all, growing and saving the seeds to all these vegetables is really fine, you know. He said, but it's like the icing on the cake. We've forgotten that we need the cake. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and literally, you know, and what he means is that, you know, we argue 70 to maybe 80 percent of all the food we consume in the United States is based on grains. That's our real food system. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to be, you know, we talk about self-reliance and sustainability and local food systems. If we're not dealing in grains, man, we've missed the picture. And it just turns out that, you know, the two most popular grains, wheat and barley, are, are um, self-pollinating. And easy. To, they're in the oh. easiest category to save from. So it's like we're off and running. Nice. And also the vegetables, they only represent what? 10% of our diet or something like that. Oh, yeah. Grains are a much bigger part of our diet. Well, you, you interviewed John Jevons. I did. You know, who has written the most popular and famous book on how to grow vegetables in the world. I don't know how many. It's like in 140 countries now, his right. how to grow more vegetables. And in there, he sets up a plan on how to do that. And he actually recommends that about 70% of your garden be grains. Not only to grow calories, he calls them, you know, that's where we get our food energy, but also to grow the straw for compost that we need to keep the seven or eight percent of our garden that we're going to grow in vegetables. And so, yeah, it's all part of this uh, intercropping, you know, self reinforcing system. And it's, he does such a beautiful job of, you know, showing how you can do that on a small scale, intensive manner. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great interview. If you want to hear uh, from John Jevons, he's one of the pioneers in this field of uh, gardening. 
Uh, you can go to urbanfarmpodcast.com and type in John Jevons or just John and it'll come up. It was amazing. That was one of the ones where I was starstruck. <laughs> He's one of my heroes. So. Well, and I send people to that podcast all the time. Again, if you haven't heard that, I mean, John's, you know, nearing 70 or he's in his 70s now. He's become one of the elders and he's devoted his whole life to this. And so for those of you that want to know how to grow and grow well as the basis for great seed saving, that book is the best book there is still. And to hear him talk about it, reflect about it and, and see all and hear about all the places around the world that it has changed lives is really, really quite fun. And so thank you for doing that, that podcast, oh. Greg. Yeah. <laughs> it was my pleasure, man. Uh, Rebecca said, John Jevons also has a great video on how to clean wheat as well as grow it. And on, it's on YouTube. So it's in the chat box. But uh, Wow. I'm going to write. Write that down because here's the, you know, when most people think about grain, they think they need a 22 foot head combine, you know, to grow grain. And that nothing could be further from the truth. These are some of the myths that we're going through. I mean, Dr. Ralph Bush, who teaches at the Air Force Academy, who used to come to our grain schools and teach, uh, grows uh, the grains for his own, to make his own bread in his backyard. And he Sorry, claims no. he can, and he claims he can get about seven loaves of bread out of a hundred square feet of John Jevons type beds. And so, you know, that makes it doable. I mean, yeah. if you, you know, so you have like three of those beds, you can grow enough to make a, a, your own loaf of bread um, every other week for the whole year. <laughs> I mean, it, it really becomes a doable thing. Mm -hmm. John Jevons book is how to grow more vegetables, uh, eighth edition. And the subtitle on it is, and fruits, nuts, berries, grains, and other crops than you ever thought possible on less land then you dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so you'll have to. Then you ever dream. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember getting this book in the 1970s. Yeah. I, you know, it's astounding how many people's lives have been changed by that. Well, it really gave us hope yeah. because his, his method still to this day takes available land, available water, and available uh, manpower, well, human power, and the people in the communities all over the earth, and you multiply it out and we could all be feeding each other and making the land that we grow this food in better every time mm -hmm. we do it. That was what he set out to do. And so don't let anybody say that we need, you know, this or that to feed 10 billion people. Most of those large systems are destructive and they're yeah. dead end. You know, it's pretty right. easy to make that case. And But John makes the opposite. He's not talking about what's being destructive. He went about setting up a system to show us how to do it. And that's what I really loved about it. Yeah. And for decades, I, yeah, can't remember exactly. the, I can't remember it was published date on that, but I'm sure it's back into the 70s or early 80s. Well, I've been, I've had my, a copy for more than 40 years. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's just about it. <laughs> so let's talk about those seeds that are harder to save. Okay. So let, again, I'll, I'll start with the same methodology. And, and this is really an interesting. And again, I invite Rebecca to chime in as much as she wants to, because this is what we ran into when we started seed libraries, because you, you introduce the idea of saving seeds to a, a, a town where nobody's done it. Lots of gardeners, but people think that, you know, they have all sorts of myths about that it's difficult. I can't do it. I'm going to mess things up, all of that stuff. And you try to get them introduced. Well, the, oh, the best way to do that is to get everybody to start with the easy ones. And then naturally, the community itself starts evolving into the more difficult ones, and it kind of falls into these patterns. And so I'm interested in how that happened at the Richmond Library in Richmond, California, which Rebecca was instrumental in helping to start. So when I wrote the book, what I put as what I called the intermediate vegetables, so we've got the beginner's vegetables or the easiest ones, and then the next step up, the intermediate ones, those were vegetables that you could grow or grains, and you get the seed in the same year, but you have to be careful of cross-pollination. You have to be careful of other varieties of the same crop growing within of the vicinity, and it's different how close it can be for different crops. Otherwise, you may get pollen that you don't know about or is unplanned that may bring in characteristics that either you don't want or you don't know about. And so that just makes your life a little bit more complicated. You just can't plant and grow it and save the seeds. You've got to look around. And if you're in an urban setting, that can be problematic. And especially for flowers, flowering plants that are insect or bee pollinated, because bees can fly a mile. 
And so if you think about trying to uh, grow and save your own squash seeds, you got to start paying attention. I mean, rural gardeners, you know, it would be easy. Just grow one kind of squash in your garden for each of the different four species of squashes that there are so that you wouldn't have to worry about cross-pollination. And so it's things like corn and cucumbers and muskmelons and radishes and spinach. Those are the ones I put in the intermediate category. And so if anybody has questions about those. And so, you know, if you, um, in the book that you can get tonight and you get the PDF of, I put the distance, a reasonable distance that you would have to be separated from another uh, variety of the same crop at the same time in order to prevent cross-pollination, if that is your goal. Now, when I got started, that was everyone's goal. We want to, you know, we want things to breed true. So that's the language that you still hear people using, although somebody in one of our seed schools one time goes, you know, Bill, I went out to my garden again today, and I just couldn't find true. <laughs> I just don't see it in there. <laughs> I see all the nature complexifying and growing and cross and all these things going on, but I don't see any true. You know, what does it mean to breed true? And so you realize that that's just an abstraction that we're, you know, that we're laying down on our gardens. But I think most people understand. I want to get what I got, right? If I've got golden bantam corn and I plant it, and it's my favorite variety, and I save the seeds, that's what I want, golden bantam. I don't want somebody else messing it up. But what's happening now, and we're seeing a, a, a change and an evolution in that kind of thinking, and I think a lot of it's being brought on by the uh, uh, urgency of climate change, Oh yeah. is that people people are realizing that they want their own seeds and they want seeds to a variety that is adapted to where they live so that they need less inputs and that it'll survive 120 degree temps in the summer if that's what we get in Arizona or freezing cold temperatures in the middle of the summer because of a freak Arctic storm that comes through, whatever it is. But we want things that work where we are. And so if you start looking at most vegetable categories now, largely because of the heritage and heirloom, you know, seed movements of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and thousands. I mean, there are hundreds of varieties out there now. I mean, the last time I looked on eBay, there were like 30,000. If you type in seeds on eBay, uh -huh. I think it's like 38,000 entries. You know, there's diversity you just can't even believe. And so then that leads to a problem. How am I going to find a variety that works best for me in my yard? Out of all of those, I don't have enough time in my life to grow them all out. I mean, so I, you I'm know, gonna I'm, you. I'm going to stop you here real quick. Uh, I just right. went to eBay, typed in seeds, 159,407 results. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's still <laughs> so, how do you how do you pick through that? And so you you know you start breaking that down and you see how many peppers and tomato seeds and all, you know. So how do we do that? Well, I think that's you know those of us that have been working on that realize that you can't do it by yourself. So we've gone to community. That's the best way to solve this. Get everyone in your community to be doing it and share the information. And that's mm -hmm. largely behind the idea for seed libraries, which become centralized community sources of a place to do this sort of thing. You check something out of your seed library and you know it's been grown in your community and hopefully there's a story or some, you know, link to the person who grew it before you so you can find out, you know, all about it, where it came from and what's going on. And I'm going to stop you again. How, hold on. How do we find out about seed libraries? Oh, seedlibraries.net. And, and who did that? Rebecca. And so we can all collectively thank her on air tonight for putting out the best, maybe the best website resource History will look at back this era and say, wow, of all the things humans were doing, that was really important. <laughs> Amen to that. Yeah. All right, carry on. Sorry. Yeah, right. So what we're learning, you know, however, all that being said, let's just change the way we think about this a bit. And this this movement, I think, is most delightfully being promoted nationwide now by a seed steward. We call him named um, Joseph Lofthouse who is a member of the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and our grain trials and our seed stewards also. And Joseph's a very intelligent, he's been one of our teachers at our seed schools, very high level breeder. I won't go into all the accolades, but if you're listening, Joseph, thank you for all the great work you do. Joseph's made a change in the past few years, and he's not trying to keep lines straight, not trying to breed true, not trying to find out which particular varieties from somewhere else will work best where he is. We don't have time for that. What he's doing instead is getting everything he can and mixing it all up and planting it out in his yard and let all the crossing take place. Let the varieties that are strongest 
grow and take over, whatever, whatever happens. And his only goal is to find a squash, a beet, a carrot, a bean. Doesn't matter what its name is. Who cares? It works for him. It makes it in Paradise, Utah, where he lives. It makes it through all the changes in the weather that he's going through. And he likes it. You know, it, give, it, it yields enough for him to make it worth his while to grow it. You know, that's really important when you grow beans and you're going to eat your own beans through the winter, that sort of thing. And so we call this evolutionary breeding. It's happening in grains. There's some large scale industrial projects even going with this um, idea in mind. And it's maybe most important to apply it to the grains. You know that there were 30,000 varieties of wheat, you know, in 1900 being grown in the world on some scale. 30,000 different varieties. And so how are we going to sift through what we can find? You know, I don't know how many varieties of wheat are in the USDA gene bank, we call it the GRIN system, that we could actually get access to seeds, Mm -hmm. but it's thousands of varieties. And so what is happening now is that Occidental Arts and Ecology would be a good example. They worked with the USDA and they put together more than a thousand varieties of wheat that would work in their area of California, they thought. And they mix them all in a big bag, and they send it down there to grow out. Wow. And so they grew them out, and so all they did was save seeds from what worked. Well, it went from thousands or thousands down to hundreds the first year. And they take those, and they plant them out, and they grow them, and they see what works. And then they get down to fewer and fewer. And if you keep doing this, you'll get down to a handful of varieties, the strongest and the best. Only those things that produce the most taste best. You know, you're the one that gets to choose what you replant. Eat some of it. Find out what you like. And that way, we could quickly transition each individual area of the country back to find out what grows best where we are. Now, inevitably, somebody then raises their hand and goes, but how do you know what you're growing then? And the answer is, we send it to a university for them to test and tell us. That's what they're good at taxonomy, (laughs) genetics. They can, Mm -hmm. you know, run the DNA on it if they have to. I mean, we can always find out what it is later. But those of us that have been around us now, probably what I'm saying anyway, I'll own it, is we don't have time for everybody to go through traditional techniques to try to find out what they need, nor should we. This is way too much fun. We just have to abandon those ideas of keeping the line straight and let nature do what it does best. All right? So if you're growing these intermediate vegetables, these are things that will grow and seeds in the same year, but that could cross. What I want you to do tonight is just ask yourself, why am I keeping them from crossing? <laughs> Maybe it'd be better if they did. Maybe right. if, you know, if bees fly a mile and I'm growing a squash, I am automatically hooked into my whole community's squashes within a mile radius, theoretically. Wow, that's the best thing you could ask for. Because you don't know, maybe somebody's been growing squash in your neighborhood for 100 years, and you're getting some of that pollen, and you don't even know it, you know? Or there's a disease resistance, or a bug resistance, or whatever it is. Now, with squash especially, that first year when you save the seeds, you could get something really weird. But in most cases, most cases, you're going to get something you can eat, all right? So if you're a market gardener, and you have to take these down to the farmer's market, your crop, and make a living on it, then you may want to be careful with this. But if you're at home in your backyard and you can play and experiment, ding, 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 you just won the prize. You get to be an expert world-class seed saver. You get to be an evolutionary plant breeder. You get to explore new varieties of squash. And you get to eat all in the same thing right in your own backyard. (laughs) And you don't need to know any seed saving rules. You just save seeds from the things that work. When I've always, uh, you've answered my question now, thank you very much. I've always been curious about why squash is hard to save seeds. Because if you want a squash seed, you cut the dang thing open and you've got a handful of seeds. So it's not about actually harvesting the seeds, it's about the cross-pollinating issues. Right. And in, in the basic seed saving book, there are instructions in there for you to hand pollinate. So if you want your own squash variety and you want to control the pollen, you can There's a technique by which you learn to watch the flowers and the day before they open up so that bees could get in there, you tape them shut or use a clothespin and let them mature for a couple of more days. And then once they're mature, you open them up by hand and bring pollen from another flower that you control Uh, into that flower, shake it in and then tape it shut again Mm -hmm. until uh, the pollination process is complete. And that only takes another day or two. 
And so, and it's really fun to play with this. And you can, you know, cross two of your favorite varieties to create something that you have control over. And so seed saving is a tremendously powerful, you know, tool. And I don't want to downplay that when I talk about evolutionary plant breeding. I mean, it's just spectacular how much you can learn and what you can do. And so let me just then add in the last category tonight in case people have questions about that. And so those are things that not only cross-pollinate, but they take more than one year to get seeds. So biologically, we call them biennials, right? They they produce a plant that stores energy. I'm, I'm paraphrasing or I'm simplifying, oversimplifying, but mm-hmm. they basically produce a plant that saves energy the first year. And then the second year, they send up a flowering stalk and produce their seeds. And so if you're going to be involved with those, then you've got to manage two growing seasons. And if you live in Arizona, sometimes we can do that in one year. Right. But most of North America, you know, you're into uh, two seasons to do that. And so that adds complication. Yeah. What are we talking about? We're talking about beets or Swiss chard. We're talking about the broccoli family, you know, the broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cauliflower and cabbage and kale. And by the way, all those can cross pollinate. So you kind of have to be careful with that. We um, talk about carrots and onions and radicchios and turnips. Those are the most popular ones that people get Mm -hmm. into that are biennials, that are cross-pollinating. And they all have a little bit different techniques for doing them. I mean, in some ways, as biennials, they're easier to do, you know? So say, for instance, carrots and beets, you grow them the first year, you can actually pull them up and look at them. You can actually slice off a little bit of them and taste them. Cut the tops off, you leave a certain amount, and you put them back in the ground. And then they'll go to seed the next year. And so in that sense, you could select for the best carrots or the best beets and only save seeds from those. And so that can be a tremendously powerful technique. Nice. You know, we ought to do a, an episode, a seed chat on how to process seeds into the future. You know, because okay. I'm, I'm thinking my front yard, I have 400 carrots going to seed. There is a sea of four foot tall carrot flowers and I, you know, I just need to go cut the tops off and then I have all these seeds, but then how do you process them? So we should do a, we should do a chat about that. Right. And you, you know, you live in such a great climate, what you can do. And what I always do when we have carrot seeds is I make sure that no matter what I do, some of them fall off onto the ground right oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, why get involved in this whole big thing? If you can afford the time and space, you know, yep. just let some of them plant themselves. Cause we all know that those kinds of volunteers are better anyway. Yep. They seem to be. Yeah. Yep. That's why I have 300 carrots in my front yard right now. Right. These these I didn't plant this year. So. <laughs> I just spread I get it. seeds. Yeah, I get exactly. It. All right. I got questions what? for you. Okay. Go. Shoot. Christine from Santa Fe says, I'm trying to naturalize a native cool season grass, Mexican feather grass from seeds. I have harvested them on my property and I'm having trouble finding out if the seeds need cold stratification. So, uh, there's more to this question, so but I just want to clarify something. You might want to first share what cold stratification is. And then she says, is there a rule of thumb or basic guidelines for figuring out which seeds do and don't need the cold? Wow. These are really great questions. The word stratify comes out of the tree industry, tree seeds, because a lot of tree seeds need a cold period. Another way of saying it, it uh, has been used is vernalization winterization mm-hmm. before they, they germinate. And this is just a natural process that kept, kept those crops alive in the face of things like Indian summers, you know? So think about it. A, a plant grows all summer long. It gets to be fall, starts cooling off a bit. It drops its seeds on the ground. It gets really cold and rainy or snowy as it did in Idaho a lot of years in September, October. And then Indian summer comes, right? You get another six weeks of really warm, wonderful weather. Well, if those crop seeds germinate in that fall summer late in the year, they're all going to get killed, right? Because the real snow and the real winter is coming. So somehow these crops learned to lay dormant through a long cold period before they germinate. It was just their survival technique. And the general, yeah, the general rule is, and this is, you know, this was the one we used in Idaho. So how this pertains to the Southwest, I don't know, but our general rule was you need a cold period that's roughly equivalent to the amount of time that crop seed would be under the snow, Ooh. all right? And so, you know, we had varieties of penstemon, for instance, this beautiful flower that would grow at 
4,000 feet and only be under the snow for a, a week or two every year. And the same variety would grow at 9,000 feet and be under snow for four and a half months. And it would, you'd go up and gather seeds from the one up high and it would need about four months of cold. Put it in the refrigerator with damp compost is what we used to do with a poke a hole in a baggie so that it gets a little bit of air and make sure the compost is slightly damp. Put the seeds in with it and just throw it in the back of your refrigerator for four months. And that would break the dormancy and stratify. I'm using all the words out there, those seeds so that they would germinate easily the next spring. So to get to her specific question, are you sure that this plant needs stratification? The way to you find out is try to germinate some. Roll right. them up on a paper towel and keep them at room temperature and see if any of them germinate. And for grass seeds, that shouldn't take too long. If they really do need a cold treatment, none of them will germinate. And so then do the, you could even do the same thing. Maybe when you do it originally is roll 100 seeds up in a square, you know, 10 by 10 in a paper towel, do that twice and, and leave one in a warm place and keep it damp for, you know, a week to 10 days or two weeks to see if it germinates. Take the other one and put it in a plastic bag and poke some holes in it and toss it in the back of your refrigerator, you know, and then bring it out in a month and warm it up and see if they'll germinate then. I mean, it could, you know, um, these are kind of, you know, home ways of doing it, but they're in some ways just as effective as, you know, the the systems that are set up for it. So let's let's go to ger seed germination because I want you to kind of talk a little bit more about what you just said about germinating, test germinating seeds. And Jewel says, what is the easiest way to germinate seeds? For example, I keep planting seeds of the Arizona yellow bell or orange jubilee, which are Tacoma sands, but they never work. <laughs> well, so the, what was the common name again? The Tacoma sands, the Arizona yellow bell or the orange jubilee. They're not edibles. Right. But I'm just going to see if I can't find it because... While you do that, let me just address that. So right. germ, germ testing or germinate testing seeds is actually quite simple. And the professionals do it this way too. Basically, what you do is you take a piece of paper, piece of paper. paper. Towel. Thank yeah. you very much. Paper towel. <laughs> and put 10 seeds down times 10 rows if you want to do all of the experiments, so 100 seeds, or you can do 20 seeds at a time, and you wet the paper towel and you roll it up and keep it damp for a week. And then you unroll it, or three, day, three days to a week, and then you unroll it and see what germinated. You know, there's so many factors that go into whether something germinates in your garden, and this is a almost surefire way to figure it out. So that's how uh, Jewel, that's how you do a germ test. And that's what I would do. I would just do a germ, germination test, a germ test. Bill? Yes, that's exactly right. So to get to her um, question specifically, I don't have the Latin name in front of me, but I don't know. But here's the thing, especially for wildflower seeds, some are just notoriously hard to germinate because of, uh, you know, uh, numerous reasons. One, everything in the lily family, you know, are very, very fragile seeds. You almost have to have the seeds fall onto the ground right out of the plant itself. In other words, they need to be planted immediately in order to have any chance of germinating. We, and there's lots of speculation as to why that is. But, you know, you can't collect them, keep them in a drawer, put them in packets, pass them around, let time go by before you go and plant them. You know, they, you just get little or no germination if you do that. And so, you know, we have lots of lily family plants like the sago lilies, mariposa lilies, they're known in the Southwest more, um, yeah. things like that, that and yellow bells, the yellow bells I know from Idaho are that way. They're frittle areas. And these have a flake. Their seeds are wide and flat and light and they're kind of flaky. And so that's one of the problems that you might be coming into. There are um, wildland plants where um, germination percentage, even at its best, is really, really low. And so sometimes you go, God, I must be doing something wrong. I got thousands of seeds and I just can't get very many to germinate. Well, that might be its normal germination rate. So you have to kind of, you know, it's nice to get some references around it. So, you know, one of the things I do if I've got wildland plants, you know, is I start looking around plants.usda.gov or usda.plants.gov. I, I, I keep you, you'll find it either way, I think, in Google, um, which is the site that the USDA has used to centralize all of its 
information about flowering plants, can give you some background information. You know, the shortcut to all of this is to find out where the seeds came from to the plant that you're trying to germinate. Where did, where did this grass originate? You know, when we were talking about the grass before, where is it native to? And then uh, duplicate those conditions. There you go. You know, and as closely as you can for the soil structure, for the amount of growing season, for the temperatures that it is. If you have to create little mini climates in your yard to help approximate things, if you want to bring in plants from, you know, slightly different areas into your area. I mean, I saw, you know, one of the most astounding Idaho wildflowers. In fact, it's the state flower of uh, Montana is the bitterroot and Luisia redivivia is the Latin name. And there are actually three species of Luisia growing in Idaho and Montana. And they're very rare and they're hard to find. You have to be up kind of high. and They only last for a couple of days. So if you see, ever get to see one, you're blessed. You know, it's just such a lucky thing. And I saw all three, the only time in my life I saw all three species of Idaho bitterroots growing was in London, England at the president of Her Royal Majesty's Alpine Plant Society, who had them growing in his yard in London, England, which could be further from the climate that you would find in Idaho. Mm -hmm. But he had set up a mini climate in his yard. He had his own little mountain range, and he had a thing over it so it didn't rain on it very much. And, you know, so you can go to great lengths to getting these plants to grow, but you have to copy the environment that those plants came from. Nice. All right, I have... Six questions left for you, and so okay. we, I, I, you get like two minutes each on them. How's that sound? Okay. All right. Um, Martha says, my sister offered me se- to give me seeds from her garden in Sedona, but I live in Flagstaff. Is that a problem? Not necessarily. I mean, Flagstaff's at 7,000 feet. Sedona's at 5,000. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're from different places. However, it depends on what they are, and if you love them, and they're really important to you or your family or your sister or whatever – um, try them. That's all you can do. Maybe your next most favorite thing will come out of that. You know, there's a certain investment and time and energy to grow them to see if you like them. But that transition between the Verde Valley, which is what Sedona is in, and the Colorado Plateau, which is Flagstaff, that taking seeds back and forth between the Colorado Plateau and the Verde Valley has probably been done for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And so we know it works. <laughs> and they're right. probably closer, you know, in environment than we think. Well, and you live in the Verde Valley. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we took a, we've taken a lot of things from here up to Flagstaff and vice versa, nice. you know. And But what you want to do is start growing and saving them in Flagstaff, and they will start to take on different characteristics. They'll be more cold tolerant. They'll probably survive a greater extreme of cold to hot because that's what you get up there. And they'll mm-hmm. start to change in even one year. We know that now because of epigenetics. And so that's the important thing is find the best things that you want to start with. Bring in all the diversity you can from any place you want to bring it in and then start growing and saving your own seeds so that you can start adapting it and taking advantage of the most magical part of a seed, you know, that we're offered. And that is its self-replicating and adaptive capabilities. That's what we've lost in our modern world is understanding just how powerfully important that is. (laughs) Exactly. Dee Dee says, does cross-pollination apply to the same variety of crop or the family with different crops in it? Well, that's a good question. A family is a botanical, a taxonomical is what we call it, category for understanding the plant world. And within families, we have genera or genus is the singular of that word. And then each genus has species within it. Okay, so understanding the difference between species, genus, and family then becomes important if we want to understand seed saving and take advantage of that understanding. And so a family is a wider category and can have lots of genera in it. And so, for example, we could have what we call the Solanaceae family or tomato family. It used to be called their potato family. And within that, we can have tomatoes and peppers, and potatoes. Those are different genus within that family. And then within those genus, genera, we have individual species. And within the species, then we have varieties, all right? And the definition of a species, this is all you really have to understand, trying to make this two minutes. (laughs) The 
the definition of a species is that it won't cross, won't cross pollinate with another uh, species. All right. So all the tomatoes that you have, Lycospersicum, Lycospersicum is what we call the genus and species of modern tomatoes. All of those will cross, but they won't cross then with Lycospersicum pimpinifolia, which is an old world wild tomato. It comes from the Andes, you know, the jungles in the Andes. Doesn't cross very often. Now they're, you know, never say never. And there are wide crosses between species that we record, but generally you don't have to worry about that. So when you get down into varieties, they can cross, all right? As if they're all part of the same species, they can cross. And that's what you have to be careful of. And then if you think about families again for a minute, the big umbrella over all of this, it's important to learn the family names of most of the things we're doing because the um, seed saving techniques, the breeding systems for most families are the same. So once you know the breeding system for a family, you can hack into all of the genera. Once you understand how to save tomato seeds, in a sense, you can you know how to do peppers. Mm -hmm. You know how to do potatoes. You know how to do all the things in that family. I mean, there are differences in each genera, but generally you get a head start on it. See here, let's go with this one. If th This is from Kersey in Elizabeth, Colorado. By the way, Kersey, we looked up where Elizabeth, Colorado was at before we got on because I love Colorado and I got curious. So we kind of know where you're at now. It's a uh, town of about 1,400 people. Uh, <laughs> North of the Black Forest. <laughs> and there you go. If the season gets interrupted by an early frost, will the almost mature seeds in tender annual veggies, herbs, and flowers continue to mature and be viable in the frost-bitten stalks? Do you need to bring them inside and hang them upside down? Will that help or not? Yes. So generally, make a distinction of the plants that you grow there in Elizabeth, Colorado. And if you want a list, complete list of them, I think it's still, um, you can find it at seedstrust.com. Oh, that yeah. was my old seed company. And one of the things we learned to do is divide our vegetables into what we call cold season and warm season vegetables. And that had a different meaning than it does down here in the desert. But for us up in the mountains, what it meant was the cold season of vegetables that we were growing could survive those kinds of frosts or summer snowstorms, and they would still be okay. And so you could still leave them out and let them mature later. All right. The warm season ones, if it's going to, if you're going to have that early season killing frost or snowstorm, it's best to pull those things and bring them in. And you're right. If you'll shake the dirt out of the roots and hang the whole plant upside down. And I, we're talking about beans. We're talking about cucumbers or squash. We're talking about peppers and tomatoes. Those are all warm season. They're all fr frost fragile. Um, if you'll pull the whole plants and hang those upside down, even immature fruits in some cases will finish maturing and finish making good seed for you. Nice. The others I would leave out there, the cold season ones. And so are they going to work or not? You don't know. But guess what we do know? The ones that do survive that and do work are the ones you want to save anyway, just <laughs> right. in case that happens again. So it's doing your work for them. As John Navazio, the plant breeder at uh, Johnny Selected Seeds, said the other day on one of our programs, he said, Bill, give them hell. That's what I tell my employees all the time. He said, if you're not killing half your plants with the weather, you're not doing a good job because <laughs> we only want to save the seeds from the ones that really, really work well. And that's what they're doing at Johnny's as far as cold tolerance is concerned in nice. breeding new open pollinated crops. All right. I got a few more questions for you since we uh, last touched in and we've got like seven minutes left. So, okay. Um, All right. Darren has been uh, emailing me for about the past month. So I with a question I couldn't answer, so I wanted to throw it in tonight. So if you're out there listening, Darren, here you go. What is the best way, given that I have, may have purchased a combination of open pollinated and hybrid seeds in the past of saving seeds from what I currently harvest to make sure they're open pollinated? Just trying to wrap my head around the best practices going forward, including only buying non-GMO or non-hybrid varieties online. Well, I'm going to jump in here first by saying I, I don't think we can buy GMO seeds, can we, Bill? You know, we don't know if we are. Any, you know, things are really loosened up, but no. In most cases, they're not available to the retail market. Yeah. Now, is there GMO contamination That's in some of the varieties that we're buying, uh, you know, especially in corn or something like that? 
you know, some of the better companies have gone to testing for that, but not all of them are doing it. So we don't know at this point. But generally, that's not a not a worry. So how do we make sure that we're saving seeds from open pollinated and not hybrids? Okay, well, so first of all, let me just back out to the start of it. Best practice now, don't buy seeds. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to worry about that. Find them, you know, get a seed exchange, seed library, get them from friends online, you know, do some exploring. You know, if you have to do, bring in all the, uh, and do whatever you want, you know, uh, make yourself happy. You know, if, if, um, staying up at night and looking at catalogs and bringing in seeds from all over the world is what you want to do, do it. Now, if you've done that in the past and you're not sure if you have hybrid seeds or not, my answer is don't worry about it. Unless you're a market gardener or farmer. Again, it depends on your scale. If you're at a larger scale and you need uniformity to make your business go, then you have to pay attention. And the fact that you may have had hybrids in there may mean that the downline crops for a few generations, it depends on how well you look at them and save seeds in the future, you know, to make them more uniform. You can clean any mess up downline. You can walk through it and just save the seeds to the ones you like, and you can get any of that, you know, that other stuff out of there and make them uniform again. So you've taken on a project if you've got things mixing and matching, especially if there's hybrid stuff in there. But you're in control of that. But And if you're a small-scale backyard gardener, you have the blessing of being able to do this freely at your own leisure for as long as you want. And that's the magic. That's where we get to create new diversity. This is, you know, it's the little people like us that have always done the diversity making in a sense and now have the responsibility of the whole world of keeping it alive and sharing it again. And it's one of the things we need most sorely in all of our agricultural system. So I honor you for wanting to save your own seeds. And if you've had hybrids in the past, if, if my own attitude right now for that would be, who cares? Yeah. You know, I, it's okay if 20% or 30% of the variety that I grow up the next year from that seed that I saved don't look like the parents. Maybe they'll look better. Maybe I'll find something I really like. Maybe there was a disease resistance in the hybrid that I really want that's being passed on that I don't even see. Those are the kinds of things I would look for. And so buying non-hybrid or open pollinated seed, if you want to save seeds for the first time, it's just easier. You know, it's, it's like the beginner level. You get what you save from. So you, there's no surprises, right? But the real pay dirt for us going forward will probably be in saving seeds from hybrids, yep. taking what I've always called Mr. Toad's wild ride <laughs> and seeing what happens. I just want to do a shout out to Rebecca. She's still out there hanging in with us. Thanks, Rebecca. Richmond Grows has a, a seed saving in time of crisis class on July 14th. I'm, uh, there's a link here, but for those of you listening down the road, uh, if you'll just look up Richmond Grows, I'm sure you'll be able to find their classes. So thanks for doing that, Rebecca. Uh, always out in front. Thank yeah, you. There you go. What, what a great idea. What right. a great idea. Right. Uh, Didi from Tempe says, uh, when you harvest carrots and beets that have gone to seed in the first year, are the seeds viable to grow next year? So what you may not know, I, I don't know if I said this, Didi's in Tempe. So what I've found, right. Didi, is that my seeds go, my carrots and beets and that kind of stuff, they go to seed in one season, but that season is a year. So if I plant seeds for carrots in the fall, right now is when I'm harvesting the seeds. So it's essentially two seasons, but one year. So yeah, they'd be viable, right? Yeah, you want to be a little bit careful. There's a contradiction in carrots. It, it, on the one hand, you want your carrots to be big and good. So you don't want them going to seed very fast, right? You want them to put all that energy into doing the carrot. Mm -hmm. And then after it's done that, you want them to go to seed so you can get the seeds. And so if you just save seeds from everything that bolts and goes to seed, without looking through them, then you could be selecting for, you know, a, a return to more of a wild carrot plant that doesn't really produce a root that stores its seeds. Can you see what I'm saying there? Yeah. So All just right. be careful cool. of that. There you All go. right. And that takes experimenting. What I would do is grow a, a, your carrots and when they're ready to eat, pull them all up and see it, look at them all and only plant back the ones that are big, that look right. good. Very good. And then... And then of those, as they start to go to seed, I would let the first 
you know, half of them go to seed and I would then pull those and then only save seeds from those that went to seed a little bit later, just to be sure. That way I would be selecting for carrot seeds for carrots that don't bolt readily or easily. Oh, very good. Lynn from Wisconsin says, I'm growing Tacane Ruby Buckwheat and would like to know how to save the seeds. I have never grown it before. Simple, super simple, right? Just save the buckwheat. Yep. <laughs> you know, buckwheat has a hard shell on it. So that that's the seed. That's what you want to plant. You know, um, it is de-hulled, you know, in a lot of commercial settings because that hole's really hard. And when you de-hull it, then you hurt it. So usually de hold seed doesn't germinate very well. Oh. But um, buckwheat, to save the buckwheat and you've got the seeds. Yeah. And yeah. I've, what I've discovered is I've got a, a mill that I grind all my own flour fresh now. And even the hard buckwheat that comes right in from the field will grind in that. And I like the, the, the dark flakes and the flavor it brings into my flour. So. You know, I've heard you tell a story about somebody that walked into the store at Native Seed Search looking for seeds for beans. It was a bean, yeah. Tell tell that story because it that that's very telling. Yeah. Well, we you know at Native Seed Search we sold seeds in seed packets out in front. When I was there, we made the whole front a seed temple, and we had all these racks of you know there were three hundred different kind. Of, you know, we had two thousand different varieties of things from the Southwest. It was just so much fun. It was like candy store Christmas every day. And then we also sold food, you know, of Southwestern, you know, things that were hard to, to get, like tepary beans and, and Southwestern bean varieties and chile and, and those sorts of things that you just didn't see or couldn't find other places. And so a woman, I think there was yellow woman Indian bean, it's called, whether it's appropriate to you call them that into the future, I don't know, but that was the name that was on it when I was there. And I mean no disrespect by calling them that. And so she um, had, she bought the beans, a pound of the beans in the back where the food was. And then she went out to the rack and she couldn't find, we were out of the seats on the seed rack. And so she came to the cash register and asked if where she could get some yellow woman Indian bean seed. And although she, and she had a package of a one pound quantity of it right there in front of her on the on the, you know, by the cash register. And, and it was like, we all started laughing because those are the seeds, you know, we forget that this is all the same thing. And that's what I would say about the buckwheat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Charlotte from Gilbert says, and I, I, I hope you know what this means. Does the seed float test work or am I tossing viable seeds? Okay. Well, it just depends on what variety, Yeah. what you're talking about. Generally, if you ferment tomato seeds, use yeah, what they call the wet seed method, yeah, the good seeds sink. And the seeds that are immature or haven't, you know, that are lightweight float away. We let those go. So, yeah. But you, you have to stir it really well and you have to leave it in there for four or five days before you make that determination. Perfect. Two questions left. We're coming down the home stretch here. Didi from Tempe says, when you're saving seeds from crops like brassicas, does the size of the pod matter? Also, can you pull the plant and let the pods turn brown or does it have to brown while it's in the ground well you want to leave it in the ground as long as you can yep. but if you do you know those pods split open and all the seeds mm -hmm. gone so you you know this is part of the craft there's no shortcut to becoming a good seeds person along these lines this is what we were talking about greg is how do you clean them how do you process them yep. all of that has to be you know you you've got to go through the experience and you'll develop your own techniques but if you have to you can pull the whole plant and let them finish. I just did that with uh, some arugula, which is in, you know, it's not oh. a brassica per se, but it's got oh. uh, seed pods that look a lot alike. Mm -hmm. So, and then does the size of the pods matter? Well, you know, it depends on what your goal is. I mean, if your goal is, to, if you're a professional seed person and you're growing for yield, in other words, you want you know, your livelihood is going to be measured in pounds of seed you get per acre off a crop. You're looking for plant vigor and pod size and seed size and those sorts of things as part of what you would want to maximize or select for. If you're a backyard gardener and you're just trying to save seeds for your own crop that works best where you are, that from something that you've tasted or is culturally important to you, pod size has nothing to do with it. I wouldn't, you know, you can only pay attention to so many things. Your right. pod size would not be very high on my personal list. 
Doesn't yeah. mean it might not be important to you, but for me, it wouldn't be important. So I love this next question. This is our final question for tonight. Uh, it's from Susan from Santa Fe. This relates directly to several meetings that we had yesterday, Susan. So Bill, what is your suggestion about holding seed school this fall? We can't do it in person. So is RMSA, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, holding an online school that we can participate in or refer people to? So yes. we have at least two. So you tell, you tell her about yours. I'll tell her about mine. Well, and we're going to work together, right? That's going to oh, yeah, be great. Yeah. We're trying to synergize here. So we have grant money, and we have just decided yesterday, you'll be the first to hear it, that we are not going to teach a live course this fall. We we had to cancel our spring one. We're going to cancel our fall one. Arizona, we just looked at the numbers here in Arizona today, and there, we had our biggest day increase ever today. Wow. You know, there is no leveling the curve here. And so we don't know how long this is going to take. And so uh, in order to be careful, and respectful, we're not going to do that. So we're moving online. So what we're thinking about now, and things are still being fleshed out, is a 10-week course. It will be uh, taught once a week for a couple of hours. Uh, it will come with a whole website full of resources and video clips that people can look at and study on their own. And then for two hours each week, we'll come together with special teachers, experts in the field for each of the different modules that we'll be presenting, and uh, live open questions in a Zoom format. And so we're, that we're, we're still trying to find our legs under us in these kinds of formats, but that's what we have planned so far. When it's called yeah. um, farmer seed training, right? Right. This will be for more for farmer level. I mean, it'll be great for everybody because the principles are easy to bring down to your own. It's easier to bring what we're teaching down to a home scale level than it would be to teach a home scale a seed saving class and have farmers come in. I mean, you know, there it'll just be a little bit of a different focus, but underlying it all will be the modules that we'll make available for all of our seed schools. So people have access to those. Well, and and it'll so, start, it, it, we're, I think we're planning on starting it in September at this point. Well, and we're, yeah. We hope to get all the promo stuff up as soon as we can now. Well, and the exciting thing is, so this is farmer seed training. This is different than seed school online, correct? This is this will be different than anything we've ever done. Yes. Nice. So we do Urban Farm U does seed school online. And what we've decided to do this year, the second week of November is do a online seed summit. And Rebecca, I'm hoping you're going to be one of our presenters. Just say and I'll send you an email. But what it will include, it'll be a free summit for the week. And what it will include is four of the eight modules from Seed School Online. And what we decided to do yesterday, also, if you do the farmer seed training, that this will be included in that as well. And then we'll put together a bundle of the entire Seed School Online, plus a bunch of other resources, and that will be in November. So you have seed farmer seed training that's happening in September, October, November, and then we have our global seed summit that we'll be, we will be offering in November. So there's lots of opportunities this fall. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. You know, just to pitch, we're going to make the Global Seed Summit really global. Oh, yeah. yeah. We have friends now and working on the same thing all over the planet. Yeah. It's really wonderful how, you know, people are coming together around this and see its importance. And so it's really going to be a special thing. So we'll do our course and then it'll, uh, the, the climax will be this summit. It'll be great. Nice. So how do people find you at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance? RockyMountainSeeds.org. And what I want to point out, since I didn't have time to to talk about it, was that if you will go to our, um, on our website, we have a menu called resources. And if you'll pull that down and go to recommended books, you'll find all of the books that I was going to mention tonight for seed saving and processing and you know, finding wildland plants and all those kinds of different things. That's all on there. So you can find quick links to all those books. There you go. Any final thoughts, Bill? Wow. This has been um, great fun. What I, uh, you know, I guess my final thought is that um, have fun doing this and get into trouble doing this, <laughs> you know, break all the rules. Let's become evolutionary plant breeders. Like right now, that's been become my passion. I realized I was growing tomatoes in my yard this year, 
and I realized I did it. I did the wrong thing. I'm going to get um, about 40 or 50 or 60 different kinds of tomatoes next year, mix them all, all the seeds together, uh, and grow out a handful of them and see which ones work best in my backyard. I'm going to do the same thing with all my crops. I'm starting over. I, I'm not going to decide what my favorite crops are. I'm going to cast a wide genetic net and develop the skills to select out of that the plants that actually work better here because right. I think I'll get farther down the road, especially with the things I love to eat, like tomatoes. So that's my ending thought. Farm out. Farm out, farm out. And as farm I always out. like to say, farm out, and we will catch you on the flip side. See you next month. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.